Hello, my name is John Mann and I'm part of the Ipswich Vineyard preaching team. Our current topic is the Invitational Church and this is going to be the first of two sermons in which we'll be studying the parable of the Good Samaritan to better understand what an Invitational Church looks like. The title of this sermon is Courage and Rejection. Now, how many of you know a TV series called Father Brown? Um, Father Brown is one of those great detectives like Miss Marble or Hercule Poirot who can see the clues that others can't. Well, Father Brown, before he was on TV, was a character in a series of books by G.K. Chesterton, who was a fascinating person. He lived from 1874 to 1936 and was a passionate defender of Christianity having debates with such people as H.G. Wells, George Bernard Shaw and Bertrand Russell. Now, G.K. Chesterton said something very interesting about Christianity. He said, Christianity has not been tried and found wanting. It has been found difficult and therefore not tried. I hope over the next two weeks that God can perhaps help us to rethink some of the notions we have about what it means to try being a Christian. In the Good Samaritan, we read of someone knocked down and left for dead who was given oil and wine and helped to get back up again. People today are hurting, and perhaps through us, they can receive the oil and wine of the Holy Spirit for their hurts and their wounds. In my previous sermon on Father's Day, you might remember I focused on the importance of recognising and valuing differences in our families. Ipswich Vineyard is a welcoming community and we often call our, that we often call our church family and I wonder if we can get a fresh understanding of how, through valuing difference and diversity, we can help our church family take things to the next level. So here's a map of Jericho, uh, of uh, Jerusalem to Jericho. Um, let's remind ourselves of the parable of the Good Samaritan. It's about a journey from Jerusalem to Jericho, and here it is on Google Maps. Apparently, walking it takes a little over seven hours. Jerusalem is 1,200 feet above sea level, while Jericho is 2,200 feet below sea level. So as you can see, it looks like you're going downhill all the way. And I couldn't help wondering, rather frivolously, if you could uh, do it on a bike without pedaling. Uh, here's another slide. Uh, this shows where Jerusalem is in relation to Samaria. At the time of Jesus, the road was known as the Way of Blood because the blood shed there by robbers. So it wasn't a great journey to take. Um, here we see there where it is in relation to a general map of the area. And incidentally, I wonder if Jesus thought of this parable after he had been to Samaria. Do you know the longest conversation recorded that anyone has with Jesus? If you were in our core community, you would know, because we've been discussing it recently. It is the one with the woman at the well of Samaria. And after she is commissioned by Jesus to go and tell others, that we read that many believed because of the woman's testimony. So Jesus certainly has a much better time with the Samaritans than with the Judeans. Perhaps through this parable, Jesus wants to say to the Judeans, you think the Samaritans are bad people? I've been to Samaria. I know these people, and I know they are actually very kind and welcoming. Even to a group of us from Judea, they showed us great hospitality and love. So <coughs> let's read the parable of the Good Samaritan. It's found in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, verses 25 to 37. Now, this is in the New International Translation. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbour as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbour? 
In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, that's a temple attendant by the way, uh, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. But when a Samaritan, as he travelled, came to where the man was, and where he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him, bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. He went to him, oh sorry, um, he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Now, which of these three do you think was a neighbour to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him, and Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Now what Jesus does here is very interesting. What we think Jesus is going to do is show us which people we should help. After all, that's what he's asked. Who is my neighbour? If I have to love my neighbour, well, who is it I have to love? If Jesus could, was going to do that, he would have made the Samaritan the one attacked by robbers and left by the side of the road. Remember the Jews and the Samaritans hated each other. Then the parable would be a Jewish guy who was walking along and saw a Samaritan left for dead and he cared for him. And so, Mr. Expert in the Law, that's what you ought to do too. But, you see the Samaritan, you see if the Samaritan was a victim, the expert in the law is going to protest. No way! The Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. You see, Jesus hadn't given him a reason to see the Samaritan differently. Jesus would have just been commanding the man to do something without changing his way of thinking. By giving the Samaritan agency in the parable and making him the one who does good, now Jesus is forcing the expert in the law to see the Samaritan differently. Now the Samaritan is a good human being. The Samaritan is someone who risks his life to help a stranger. Someone who did something even the very religious priest and Levite wouldn't do. Jesus forces the expert in the law to reframe the way he sees Samaritans. That's why when someone in the 1970s came up with an updated version of this called the parable of the good punk rocker, it was a great reinterpretation because at the time the newspapers were vilifying punks and saying how awful they all were. So the parable of the good punk rocker helped people to reframe how they looked at punks and see them as human beings first, not some outcasts representing all that was bad in society. Now, I want us to look at ways in which we can reframe how we think of groups of people. And the first group is us Christians. It might not have escaped your notice that Christians are often seen in the media in a bad light, some of it deserved. It is part of the general Western culture now that if you meet a Christian in a soap or a film or a drama, we can almost guarantee that they will be a bad person. Religious people are often seen as judgmental, more concerned about the reputation of their organisation than anyone who's been hurt by that organisation. They are seen as perhaps fanatical, not living in the real world, people who just want your money. In fact, for many people today, the parable of the Good Samaritan, it would be religious people that are both the robbers as well as the ones who walk by on the other side. So what can we do as an invitational church family to reframe how people might perceive us? To help us think about this, let's look at the story that follows the parable of the Good Samaritan in Luke 10, 38 to 42, this time using the Passion Translation. This is the story of Jesus visiting Mary and Martha. It reads as follows. 
As Jesus and the disciples continued on their journey, they came to a village where a woman welcomed Jesus into her home. Her name was Martha, and she had a sister named Mary. Mary sat down attentively before the master, absorbing every revelation he shared. But Martha became exasperated with finishing the numerous household chores in preparation for her guests. So she interrupted Jesus and said, Lord, don't you think it's unfair that my sister left me to do all the work by myself? You should tell her to get up and help me. The Lord answered her, Martha, my beloved Martha, why are you upset and troubled, pulled away by all these distractions? Mary has discovered the one thing most important by choosing to sit at my feet. She is undistracted and I won't take this privilege from her. When a visitor walks through our doors, could we think of it as Jesus coming to visit us as he visited Martha and Mary? Would we then want to sit and listen and spend time with them and hear what they have to teach us? But let's also think outside of the church. How often are we as individuals very busy with important things that need to be done and thinking we don't have time for nurturing and building relationships with others? Are we able to help the new guy at work find their feet or spend time with our family finding out how their day was? I see Martha as the busy person thinking there aren't enough hours in the day to get everything done. But in the example of Mary, Jesus is saying, wait upon me, sit at my feet, spend time listening to others, getting to know those around us in a more meaningful way. You might remember the title of this sermon is Courage and Rejection, and I want us to think of someone coming to visit a church group for the first time. Think of the courage it takes, given all the negative press there is about religious groups, to come to visit a church. For many of us, coming through the church doors is the easiest thing in the world, and we've been doing it for years. But for a newcomer who perhaps hasn't even been to a church before, it might be terrifying. Given the possibly high level of anxiety someone might have, don't you think it would be very easy for one of us to accidentally give the wrong signal? I know many of us at Vineyard, Vin, um, many of us, Vineyard isn't the first church we've been to. And I wonder if anyone here has felt rejected at the church they went to. Maybe in our small groups or at some other time, we could share those experiences and learn any lessons. Remember that people might come to church because of some crisis going on in their lives and they don't know where else to turn. What that crisis might be is probably not going to be evident just by a brief conversation or a welcome. We want to extend the kingdom. We want to create a colony of heaven on earth. Ipswich Vineyard has important values. Respect others, be kind, be non-judgmental, assume the best in others, be open and genuine, show humility with others. But to make those values real, I suggest it's important to try to learn all we can about those who aren't like us. It's very easy to hear about groups in the news or in the media without learning about the people who make up those groups. Jesus reframed the way a Jewish expert in the law viewed Samaritans by showing him one Samaritan who was kind and good. There are plenty of resources around films, documentaries, books, blogs, where people with different experiences to our own tell their stories. I know we don't always feel like a documentary, sometimes we just want to relax in some escapism, but there are some stories and documentaries that I feel really moved by and I've learned something important. Even if I didn't really feel like watching it at the start, afterwards I'm glad I did so. So let's try and give ourselves a little push to be curious to learn about what others are going through. If you have seen or read something like I'm describing, perhaps you could share it with others as a recommendation. Now, we're not all the same, and for each of us, who the other person is um, will be different. And perhaps we don't know um, that a person, or do, sorry, what is this? Now, we're not all the same. For each of us, the other 
who perhaps we don't know, is a person or individual who will be different. But for example, we can find stories of individual people who are asylum seekers, refugees, people with other gender identities or sexual orientations, people from other cultures and nations, what it is like being a young person today or an elderly person today, a differently abled person, a neurologically different person such as with autism, what it is like to have a mental illness, to live with depression or with a chronic disease, what it's like having a friend or family member who committed suicide, or what it's like being diagnosed with cancer. Now obviously reading and watching isn't the same as experiencing it for yourself, but if we are better informed and more em empathetic, empathetic, it can only be a good thing. This also led me to think about whether we could do more in our core communities for people to share their stories. Obviously sometimes these are painful and difficult to share and a lot of trust has to be built up, but it would be another way of broadening our awareness. Putting human faces on groups we might have heard about in the news will surely make us kinder, more understanding and better informed about others. It will help us see people as individuals and it will make us a better church family and help us to get to that next level of being a group where people of all backgrounds feel affirmed and accepted and valued. We are extending the kingdom when we see that God invites everyone to the table. It doesn't matter who they are or what they have done, where they come from, it is by grace and not tradition and by embracing diversity and valuing that diversity, we extend the kingdom because we understand that it includes both Jew and Samaritan as people like you and me, and people unlike you and me. I was brought up in a village called East Pergold, which probably wasn't the most culturally diverse community in the 1960s and 70s. But my parents went to a church in Ipswich that was very diverse. We had a lot of people from the West Indies, also people from Africa, from India, from Australia and from the USA, and we were a church family who did things together. Many of the members had young families also, so as a child I grew up with a far more diverse group of friends than I would have done if I hadn't been a part of that church. I hope that after this encounter with Jesus, the expert in the law understood that the kingdom included both Jew and Samaritan, because he started to see people as God sees them, and not through a religious lens of exclusion. We at Ipswich Vineyard are creating a colony of heaven. We want to be a family that is full of the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. We are a community based on relationship love, trust and acceptance of difference. We are a community where everyone can feel they belong and can know they are valued and affirmed. So let's rededicate ourselves today to that vision. Thank you.